This essay isn't like the oh, thousands of essays I've written over the past 25 years. This essay contains no written words. It is merely a video of me talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the other day I wrote an essay from a web page uh, about the uh, better angels of our nature. And in that video uh, and essay, uh, I talked about looking into my eyes. And also looking into the eyes of somebody else. I have spent um, decades in college, grad school, postgraduate school. I've taught for two decades um, at the college level. Um, and from my vantage point, from my perspective, from my Dalton Shang, I believe that the best education occurs when it is called blended learning. In other words, on-site lecture, discussion among the class, and also online. And I don't want to go into the various advantages of that, but trust me, it is better to have blended learning where you can do both, read and listen. And and one of the one of the aspects of the advantage of blended learning is not only can you can you write things out in an orderly way and, and systematically and paragraph by paragraph by paragraph and explain it in detail. But you also give the student the opportunity to watch you and how you conduct yourself. They can watch your eyes. They can watch your behavior in front of them. And I, I really believe it. If, if I was in charge of all education in the world, all education in the world would be done via blended learning. Um, and for the last three and a half years, I've used uh, an attempt at blended learning on my web page. And I owe a great deal to uh, Clarence Page, who writes for the Tribune, because I was looking up something that he had said um, several years ago. And I, I couldn't find it, so I just simply went to the Trib's web page. And what did I discover when I got to Page's part of the web page? He was introducing his op-ed column by prefacing it via you know, a video. This is what I'm going to talk about. I want you to understand it. Da, 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 da. That was the end of the video. And you watched or you read the, the essay. From that day on, for the last three and a half years, every essay has been blended learning. A video and a uh, and the text. And so this video I want you to watch my eyes. This video is the result of, um, of that essay that I wrote just the other day, The Better Angels. Um, 
And for me, that experience of um, of that essay uh, was transformative to me, or for me. Um, in my opinion, what happened in Charlottesville is an axial, axial event. Um, we have uh, moved from going in one direction in the United States to another. And that's the axial event, the, the change of directions. Not so much a change in directions, but more a change of intensity in the directions. And on August 15th, 2017, there was an axial event, at least in my mind, but also in the minds of millions of Americans. Several weeks before that, I had written an, an essay about me and my shrink. My shrink is a former student of mine who I've had in two classes. And we get together every couple of months to have um, to engage in psychotherapy. And he, um, we have a breakfast together, and the breakfast lasts from like 8.30, 9 o'clock till near noon. And the last time I was there um, at a restaurant in Chicagoland, I told Chris, I said, there's a bunch of things I want to talk to you about. And I rattled them off, there were about seven. And um, as, if, <laughs> as if we were going to address all seven of them. But one of, the, one of the things that we did address was a statement from me about, and, and I'm telling you honestly, I don't fully understand it. And the, and, and, and the words, the words I've chosen is, is, is probably not the best word. But there are times in my life, uh, and not very many times, but there are a handful of times that I can look back upon um, and describe those events as kind of euphoric, um, euphoric events of um, that I'm taking to another level of existence um, that I feel inherently different um, or changed or involved in the moment. You know, if you were to evaluate where I am emotionally from a scale of one to 10, and one is depressed and 10 is euphoric, most of my life is spent around the 80th percentile. I'm happy. You know, things to do, busy. But there are occasions, and trust me, I'm telling you the truth, there are occasions when I go from where I am, you know, at the 80 percentile to a much higher level, closer to a 10. And, and you know, and it's, and it's, and it's hard to describe. It, it, it's hard. I'm just telling you, it's hard to describe them. I'm going to tell you how I feel about it. When those events occur, 
you know, it's not that all the problems in the world have been resolved and we're going to live in paradise forever, comma, but you at least have a sense. And when I was writing that essay um, about what Lincoln said during his first inaugural about the better angels, that euphoric feeling came back. Trust me. And writing that essay kind of congealed all of my feelings emotionally and started putting the, the puzzle together and, and it started to get a frame around the puzzle and the pieces started to fall in and it makes sense to me. Four years ago, uh, during winter break from teaching, I spent a month in Myanmar, it used to be called Burma. And um, I'd gone to uh, Burma or Myanmar to uh, try to interview the lady, Dalan San Suu Kyi the single most important woman in the entire world when it comes to human rights. She has done more for human rights at a greater cost to her physically and mentally than any other woman that I know of and is far ahead of the vast majority of other men. I tried six, nine months before I even left the United States to make contact with her. I've done everything. Since I've been there, I tried to make contact. In the four years since I've been to Myanmar, I have talked to American Embassy. I've done everything they have told me to do. And I have not been successful. Comma. But... In about four months, I'm going back to Myanmar. I haven't heard from the lady, but I think I'll do it. <clears throat> but when I went to Myanmar for the first time, four years ago, I met um, a Burmese guy by the name of uh, Min Kunan. And in my estimation, in my personal estimation, Min Kunan is, is Bobby Kennedy in Burma. Um, I interviewed him, the interviews on my webpage. And um, I was there during winter break but I wanted to make sure I'd be there on January 4th, which is the Burmese or Myanmar's Independence Day from the British. And I was invited to uh, a luncheon at the 8888 Generations headquarters in Yangon. And I met all the old guard. <laughs> true story. Some of them would come in and some would go eat and go and some more people would come in. And, and I couldn't understand the, what was happening, but I was having fun talking to all these people. And in the middle of this luncheon that was kind of a, an ebb and flow luncheon, there were people coming in and coming and going. <laughs> Min Kanan leans behind somebody and comes over toward me and says, uh, what time does your plane leave tonight to go back to the States? And I said, like, nine, eight or nine o'clock tonight. And he says, at noon. And then he smiled and he said, um, 
Would you like to go to a protest rally at Shula Bogota today? Going to the protest rally at Shula Bogota. We're on 8888. There was an 8888 uprising where the military dictatorship came in and just shot people, killed them. Because on August 8th, 1988, the Burmese people wanted freedom. I went to that rally, which was near Shula Bogota. Shula Bogota is a, a pagoda on a, a kind of a, this, the axial wheel or axe area of a, of a giant wheel. It was a, um, the main intersection of that part of Yangon, and, and all the roads come into Shula Bogota, and the pagoda is in the middle of all these converging roads. And so when they talk about the Shula Bogota, the protest rally at Shula Bogota, um, there are hundreds of thousands of people there in 8888. It wasn't at the Bogota, it was in that general area. You couldn't have gotten that many people. You know, so it would be you know, miles down the roads in Yangon before you could get all those people into that area. But they call it Shula Bogota the road protest rally in Shula Bogota. And we were probably uh, the, the 888 eight, eight generation protest rally was probably a quarter of a mile from Shula Bogota. And there I was I mean, I know absolutely no word in Burmese. I can't say hello, goodbye, thank you, anything else, let alone listen to speeches of all the people I've just met and their speech about human rights. And so all that I did for an hour or two hours walking around this protest rally was to uh, look at the protesters. And, and this is one of those euphoric moments. I, I was not sure where I was. Now here I was looking around a protest rally in Yangon, and my mind was back in the United States during the 60s in a protest rally all over the East Coast or in the Mid-South. And then I flip back and I hear Burmese being spoken, I, was, I, mean, I could not understand it. Could not, you know, there's not a single word I, I got, but I got the message. And the only thing that was echoing in my head at that time was Joan Baez singing, We Shall Overcome. Trust me. That was a euphoric moment for me. It changed my life. Prior to going to that protest rally, I had traveled in the, uh, what they call the tourist triangle and uh, Burma is a great country. Of all the places I've been in the world, that is the one place you know, that, that radically changed who I was. But I went up to a place um, in northern Burma, in the northern part of that 
Torres Triangle, a play called Inlay Lake. And um, my tour guide was a young woman by the name of Momo. And um, I was going from that place to someplace else, and she had to get some paperwork. And so she went, she said, Do you mind if we stop by my place, pick up the paperwork, and then I'll take you to the next location and say goodbye? Uh, and she said, um, and I said, no, no problem with that. She said, um, also, you could meet my daughter, who, who at that time was nine years old. And her name is T.T. I walked into their living room, and there was a nine-year-old girl standing with a big smile. And she said, my name is T.T. Do you want to play some games with me? And I said, what kind of games do you know? She said, do you know how, she said to me, do you know how to play Scrabble? <laughs> we sat on the floor in their living room playing Scrabble for an hour. And that was a euphoric moment for me. I met my granddaughter. And it's, and you know, go to my webpage and just write TI space TI. It's going to take you hours to read all that I've written about her. But in a way, the protest rally in Shula Bogota and playing Scrabble with TT are all interrelated, not only euphorically, but politically. They they all they, they all motivate me, and 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 I've spent a lot of time trying to process the hauntings. Why? Why? Why going? I mean, if I if I grew up, I mean, if I began my adult life in protest rallies in the United States. What? At the end of my twilight years, going to a protest rally in Yangon, so what? You know, who cares? And, and genetically, Titi is not my granddaughter. But she is. And why? Ten years ago, almost, almost exactly ten years ago, in 2008, I danced with death twice. Fell off a ladder, cracked my head open, had a subdural hematoma or a traumatic brain injury. I was in intensive care for four weeks. Don't remember anything. Don't remember going to rehab hospital for three weeks except for the last ten days. And then there was prostate cancer and metastasized outside my prostate. The surgeons in the University of Chicago took my prostate out robotically, but the surgeon, Dr. Zorn, said, you're coming back here every six months for a PSA test because it's outside the prostate. A couple years later, the PSA came jumping up, and I came back every six months, and when it jumped, I went back to, back to the University of Chicago and had... Uh, Two months of um, hormone therapy, and four or two months of radiation, plus another two months of hormone therapy. I'm uh, going on to my seventh seventh year now, cancer free. Those two dances with death woken awoken within me. the realization that I don't have forever. Everybody knows they're going to die. Everybody up here, they know it. Unless you've done the dance, 
you don't know it in your gut. And that was a transformative event. And I know, I know that, you know, I have a limited amount of time. I'm healthy, I exercise every day. But I, you know, 70, almost 75 years of age, the clock is ticking. And the issue is, what am I doing? And it has to do with legacy. I'm not going to be the president of the world. I'm just going to be me. But I know something many people don't know. And that is that there is a legacy that you have to leave or you will leave your children and your friends and, and the world. And that legacy is what you give to the world because of what the world has given to you. I don't have any money to buy that up between my kids and my grandchildren when I go. I can make them rich. But the legacy is what you have left the world and how you have left the world a better place. They told you about being Shula Bagoda and flipping between Yangon and America, back and forth. You know, it was almost dizzying. I mean, I knew where I was, but my head was in another world, in another place, at another time. And I, and I think if, if there's anything that dancing with death does for a person, it is, or at least it should, and it did for me, it should awaken you to the meaning of living and also the meaning of that you're, the clock is ticking. So you better get your you know what in gear. Back in the 60s, we were concerned about civil rights. As if we fought for civil rights and we got it in the 60s and now we can go on fighting for something else. And then on August 15th, 2017, Donald the Dumb woke me up and the rest of America to a realization that we ain't that far away from where we were at the beginning of my adult life and racism and bigotry. And so You go to my webpage and click on articles and when you see that index page, look on the right hand side and it says critical issues and there uh, dozen what well, I consider critical issues. Just scroll down until you see Randy Posh's last lecture. Watch that last lecture. Randy Posh was dying of pancreatic cancer when he gave his last lecture watch him during that lecture and say to me, yeah, I'm sure he had pancreatic cancer. About nine months later, he was dead. But Randy Posh lives on and many, many people. And there I was playing Scrabble with a nine-year-old gal who, you know, she, <laughs> and, and the interesting thing about TT is that at the end of the game, I said to her, 
you know, this has really been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. You know, you've been a nice kid, and we had a lot of fun. And she said, oh, wait. I said, what's wrong? She said, I want to have the score. <laughs> and so I wrote, waited a couple moments, and she had up the score, and then those eyes lit up. She says, I beat you. And I stuck my finger in her face. I said, young lady, never forget that. You beat me at my game in my language in your country. I'm proud of TT. I'm proud of Min Kun Han. I'm proud of the lady. I'm proud of the Burmese people who are struggling to survive. And I'm also proud of Americans. Who understand the issues of human rights and civil rights and equality. America has not yet gotten to the promised land on the issue of civil rights. Comma. But on August 15th, 2017, there was an actual, an axial event, a change, a change that motivated most Americans to move to a higher level. When I watched Donald the Dumb standing in front of the elevators at Trump Towers, Trump Tower, um, when I thought was about another person standing in a doorway at the University of Alabama, and his name is George Wallace. I didn't see any difference. Donald Dunham is no better than George Wallace. Wallace said that 54 years ago. And that was a changing event in the civil rights movement in America. During Lincoln's first inaugural address, <clears throat> He talked about remembering the mystic chords of the past. The times when we were a better person as a nation. And that what, what Lincoln was trying to get America to do in the midst of the Civil War was to get America to follow the better angels of their nature. It's interesting to me that this feeling of euphoria, and we have a long ways to go before we get to the promised land as far as civil rights, human rights. But we are moving.
And the interesting thing is that what happened in Yangon at Shula Bagoda when I was there four years ago, the only English that I understood while I wandered around was the song, We Shall Overcome. There ain't nothing I can do about Donald the Dumb. I can't control his agenda. Actually, Donald the Dumb can't control his either. But this is addressed to America and not to Donald the Dumb. we shall overcome. And in the next weeks and months, that song will resonate throughout our nation like it did back in the 60s. We shall overcome. Wallace got out of the doorway. Donald, get out of the presidency. You are a despicable, racist bigot. America will overcome. Believe me. I appreciate your time watching and listening to this video. What we need to do is listen to the better angels of our nature. Take care.